Amen. Just looking at him. and You know, <clears throat> the, the older I get, the more I realize, the less I know. You know, you, you ever just think, I got that, and then you live a little bit, you know, and, and uh, to see how God's worked in his life, man, I, I think you've far surpassed me, man. I, I marvel, man. I, I do. Like I said, you could easily be my pastor. I just thank God for you and how he's worked in your life. And that was all of the Lord. The Lord called him. And all the ministry that I've been involved in, God's given me an eye for preachers that God has his hands on. And as soon as I met him, I knew God had his hand on him. And, and what an honor and a privilege it was to be his pastor and to see how God's taking him now and, and to see what he's doing here. You know, the, the best is still yet to come here for, for Independent ba Baptist Church of Anchorage. You, you may think, well, we've hit our, we've hit our, 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 our uh, mountaintop. No, there's another mountain that God wants to take you to. And, and I, I can just sense God's getting ready to do something great. I, I sense that God's getting ready to do something great in America. Amen. You know, it, it seems dark. But that's when the light shines best, when it's dark. And so just let your light shine. I believe God's really, uh, getting ready to do something. I think he's going to do something in America. And, um, you know, we serve a, a great God, a big God, and, I, and, I, and he uses small people. And he, he uses little people. And I'm a little person, and I'm a nobody. But I think uh, God wants to use me there in Charlotte to do something great for his namesake. And you guys have a part in that, in that you've invested financially and and through your prayers, as we're there trying to labor and see uh, God do something great, uh, there and starting in Charlotte. I mean, what would our nation be like if, if we had revival in America? I know you're up here, and you're kind of detached from it, but you're still part of it. But wouldn't it be great if God just did something, uh, sent revival to America? Instead of turning the news on and seeing all these people being killed and all that sort of stuff, they're seeing folks, folks just uh, uh, doing right. Wouldn't that be great? And so I, I'm, I, I believe that revival can come, and, and uh, I believe it can come in our day. It's just uh, where we be the people that God will use to bring revival. But uh, anyway, let me get into the Word of God. Uh, I'm so excited about being here. Like I said, it's a challenge for me to preach to you because you're under some tr tremendous preaching um, I remember watching a video cl uh, clip of uh, Pastor McGovern uh, preaching over in um, Pawpaw, New Guinea. And uh, I didn't understand a word that he said, but boy, he got me fired up. I was just fired up just looking at him, man. He was, he was, just, he was just shucking the corn. And, uh, and uh, so it's a challenge for me to, be a, uh, to, to follow that and, and uh, to, to really, uh, you know, do any more than what he's already doing. So I... I'm just going to come here and just kind of give you something to trust the Lord to bless. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Ephesians chapter number 5 again. Ephesians chapter number 5. I, I'd ask that you spend, uh, if it's been a while that you've camped out in the book of Ephesians, uh, I want to encourage you to do that. Because the, the, the theme that's going through Ephesians is in Christ. All that we have in Christ. And I tell you what, you will, you might get fired up when you see what you have and who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. And spend some time just being in there. And Paul just got some tremendous stuff here in, in uh, his letter to the saints at Ephesus. But in Ephesians chapter number five. And um, we want to start in verse, uh, verse 14 again. And this time we'll stand as we'll give reverence to God's word and, and uh, show our respect for the reading of scripture this morning. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll start at verse 14 and get down to, to, um, to verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 14, where the Bible says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us today, Lord God, to discern what your will is and to do it. And Lord, we know that it will be for our good and it will be for your glory. And Lord, we pray to that end, Lord, that you would be glorified in our listening and responding to the, your word today, to the preaching of it, Lord, and to the obeying of it. 
And Lord, we do pray today, Lord, we know that you're glorified when folks get saved. And Lord, I do pray if there's one here today that is, that's not saved, that uh, don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray, Lord God, that you'll save them today before it's eternally too late. And Lord, uh, we would thank you for it. And then, God, we do pray for your blessings uh, upon our nation. Lord, I pray for President Trump. Lord, he gets a lot of criticism, but Lord, what he needs is prayer. And Lord, you say for we to pray for those who are in authority. And so we pray for him. We, Lord, we pray for your hand to be upon him. We pray for your hand to be upon all the leaders in America, Lord God. We pray for our nation. Lord, please, in Jesus' name, I pray that America would turn back to you, Lord God, that we would indeed be one nation under God, that we would indeed be one nation in God we trust. Lord, help us as a nation to turn back to you. And Lord, help us as your people, Lord, to turn uh, back to you. You said, if, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will you hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And so, Lord, we need you to work in our lives as Christians. And Lord, we are thankful for the word of God. Now, please bless it to our hearing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The thing about the will of God, there's a lot of confusion about the will of God. Just because something happened doesn't mean that God wanted it to happen. He allows it to happen. Everything that happens, and when we start talking about the sovereignty of God, we know that there's absolutely nothing can happen without, without God allowing it to happen. All right, so we know that. But God, in his wisdom and in his sovereignty, has given man something known as a free will. We can worship him or not worship him. Now, if God wanted to make us worship him, guess what we'd be doing? We'd be worshiping him 24-7. Man, he's got angels. Man, all they do is cry out the holiness of God, and they don't get tired of it. They don't get bored of doing it. Man, they just, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And they don't get tired of it, man. They cry out the holiness of God. And man, I'm looking forward to the time when God raptures us out of here. He goes through the millennial kingdom reign of Christ. And then he says, okay, I'm done with that. Behold, I make all things new. I'm looking forward to this time, to the time I'll never disappoint him again. I'm looking forward to the time I won't be on no clouds eating some grapes. You know, you know, you think, well, I'm going to heaven. I'm eat grapes. <laughs> No, man, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to have, get this. We're going to get our eternal assignment. We're going to get our eternal assignment and we're going to be happy doing it. And folks talking about, I don't want to go to heaven. I, it's boring up there. I want drama in my life. I mean, man, you can have all that drama. You can have mine too, you know. Man, I'm looking forward to, to, uh, to being there and, and doing my eternal assignment and being happy. But if God wanted to right now, right now, if he wanted to, if God wanted to right now, he can make us all do what he wants us to do. But God says, no, I want you to I want you to do what I want you to do because you want to. Because you want to. I want you to go to church because you want to. I want you to read your Bible because you want to. I want you. You know, we make witness in such a, 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 a drudgery. But you ought to witness because you want to. Amen. Witnessing is nothing more than you testifying of something that happened. The world has God on trial. And they say, can anybody talk about the grace of God that passes all understanding? You know what should happen? Your head should go. I can tell you about the grace of God. Amen. Amen. I stand up, Your Honor, can I speak up? I can tell you about the grace of God because it happened to me, amen. And it's been working in my life for 42 years. Now sit down. And then when somebody else brings a charge against God, can anyone here testify of the love of God? Please call on me, amen. I can talk about the love of God. In 1974, I prayed to God. I said, God, the first time I got honest with God, I said, God, if you show me how to love you, I'll love you. I want to love you, but I don't love you because I don't know how to love you. Show me how to love you, and I'll love you. In 1977, 
The 11th of September, 1977, God showed his love to me. And I love him. Amen. I love him because he first loved me, man. Can anyone talk about the forgiveness of God? Woo! Woo so you can only testify when you have experienced or you were there. Uh, Judge Judy, he in a court case. She had somebody sitting down over there, there waving their hands. They said, what do you want? Stand up. Were you there? No, I wasn't there, but sit down. <laughs> She said, you can't tell me anything. It's hearsay. If you weren't there, you can't tell me what happened. If you was there, then you can tell me what happened. They said, well, uh, Pastor Bird, how do you know that you, you're saved? I said, I was there when it happened. And I can testify being in that pastor's office. And like you, Brother McGovern, never knew that Jesus died for me Amen. until that day. Man, I got saved and God's changing my life and still is changing my life. But when it comes to the will of God, God will let you do your own thing. He will. Everybody in here, you know, I'm doing my own thing. God said, yeah, but one day you're going to give an account for it. Amen. Do whatever you, you're over there in the Ecclesiastes, remember talking about, do whatever you want. I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it. Do whatever you want, but, but know this. Everything that you do is going to be coming to the judgment, uh, under my judgment. That we, hey, there'll be a day when I have my day. I have my say. You've been having yours. Now I'm going to have mine. And it's going to be final. God's given us a will to do his will. A God has given us a will. If we choose not to do his will, then he'll let us not do his will. But for those of us who are saved, there is a coming a time. He talked about that servant. You guys read your Bible? Pretend like you do read your Bible. Okay, pretend like it. Remember reading that place where it talks about, and that servant who knew his Lord's will but did it not, he's going to be beaten with many stripes. You guys remember reading that? Pretend like you did. Okay, yeah, I did it. I read it. I'm going to read it. Okay. He says, but then that servant who knew not his Lord's will but did things worthy of stripes is going to be beaten with few stripes. You go, well, at least I'll get off with a few stripes. I'm like this here. I want to get off with no stripes. I, I, I just assume forego the beating. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, Daddy, beat, Daddy beat you more than he beat me. Nah, 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 nah. I got 10 stripes. You got 20. Nah, 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 nah. I'd be like, nah, 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 nah. The both of you guys, I ain't getting none. Amen. I don't want to get no stripes. God's given us all a free will. And... There are some misnomers about the will of God. Some people say, well, you can't possible. It is impossible for you to know what God wants. Man, it's just God's playing games with me. I'm here to tell you, God's not playing games with, with you. Some folks say, well, you can't know God's will. God says, yes, you can know my will. It requires study. Amen. He said, listen, we turn to Romans chapter 12. Let's move here. Let's move quickly. I'm going to see if I can, I can get this message out to you. Ro Romans chapter 12, real quick. Romans chapter 12, there is a perfect will of God. There's some folks that the will of God is not knowable, but God says it is knowable. You can prove it too. Amen. Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Get this. And be not conformed to this world. You know, I find in, in, in Christianity, it seems like Christians want to it, it be, they want to look just like the world, act just like the world, and think that that's cool. And God said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. God said, we're not supposed to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen. But be ye, uh, be not, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable. And my Bible says, perfect will of God. You can know the will of God. Then there's this group of people who say, well, you can know God's will, but I'll tell you one thing, you won't like doing it. Christian life is boring. Ugh, ah, gag me with a spoon, man. The Christian life is so humdrum and boring. I beg to differ with you. 
Man, I tell you what, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I tell you what, even though my wife and I, we've been through a whole bunch of stuff as we've been trying to do this church planning thing. I tell you what, I still wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade the will of God being in the will of God. The, the best you will ever be is in the will of God, the center of God's will. I was talking to one brother. He said, Pastor Bird, he says, ever since I've been coming to this church and ever since I've been, I've gotten some things settled, man, I just, I just been going through a whirlwind, just been going through a whirlwind. I said, brother, that's because you're getting into the center of God's will. I said, it's like a hurricane. You see, all of that wind whipping around, whipping around, whipping around, all of that is on the outside, on the skirts. But guess where the peace is? Right there in the center. Hey, if you're in a whirlwind, one of two things is happening. You're either getting into the will of God or coming out of the will of God. Because you got to face those winds going in, you got to face those winds coming out. So when those winds stop blowing, I get excited. Especially when I know I'm in the center of God's will. I say, well, honey, after a while, peace is coming. We just keep moving. We just keep moving. We just keep moving to the center of God's will. And that's where that umbrella of safety is. That's where that protection is. And, you know, once we get there, we have this peace, even though all this calamity is all around you. So, honey, I'm glad we're in the center of God's will. Let's stay in it. When God moves, as he moves around, we just move right along with him. Amen. We're in the center of his will. But guess what will happen if we start getting out of his will? We're going to face those same winds in the opposite direction. I said, brother, you're just getting in the center of God's will. Keep on moving. Keep on, keep on moving until you get to that calm area. Amen. We're going to talk about discerning God's will this week. We're going to talk about these five P's to let you know when to discern if you're in God's will or not. Five P's. You're going to have to come up there to the, where are we going to? Uh, we're going to, it's in Palmer, where the bears are? Yes. Uh, Okay. Um, we're going to give that to you, how you can discern God's will, these, fi- these, these five Ps. You, we're going to shell those five Ps. But at any rate, there's some people say, well, if you, if you get in God's will, you won't like it. But I'm here to tell you, it's nothing like being in the center of God's will, even though there's a calamity going all the way around it. And then there's these folks that say, well, if you know God's will, uh, you can't do it. And God uh, allows us that we can do it. In Psalm 40, in verse 8, it, the, the psalmist says this. He says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Jesus himself, he said, well, it was, it was prophesied of him saying this in Psalm 40, verses uh, 7 and 8. He says this. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. And so um, we can delight in doing the will of God. As a matter of fact. Turn over to um, Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. Let's, let's move there. I don't hear no pages turning. Everybody got these electronic Bibles here? If you got an electronic Bible, I can't hear that. So you got to give me the sound effect. Remember the sound effect that I told you last time, right? If you got an electronic Bible, you got to go rip, 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 ding. That let me know that you're turning those pages. Now, if you got your Bible, then I can hear these pages being turned. So, all right. Well, where were we supposed to be going? Huh? All right. Oh, yeah, that means you're listening. All right. Philippians chapter number two. Okay. <laughs> Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two and verse 13. Philippians chapter two and verse 13. When God works in you, he'll give you a new want to. And he'll give you the ability to accomplish what he's called you to do. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, the Bible says this. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I can tell you, if you don't want to do anything for God, I can tell you one thing for sure. Hey, hey, this morning. If you don't want to do anything for God, I can tell you one thing is going on. God is not working in you. Because if God is working in you, you will have a new want to. He said, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and then to do of his good pleasure. And when you are being used of God, there's no better joy than to know that you're being used of God 
that you're accomplishing the purpose for which God has placed you here on the planet. So those, those misnomers that you can't know the will of God, yes, you can. If you know the will of God, then you, you can't do it. Yes, you can, you can do it. Well, if you do it, you won't like it. Listen, there's no better joy than serving the Lord. Amen. There's no better joy than serving the Lord. Amen. One of these days, I'm going to give up the ghost, and I'm going to finish my course, and I want to finish it strong. Amen. I want to be putting in that final kick. As I'm finishing, the, finishing that last turn and see that finish line in sight, man, I wanna, man, that's when I want to turn on the afterburners. Man, I want to go out strong fighting for the Lord. I'm so thankful that God led me out of Alamogordo and into Charlotte. It's a challenge there in Charlotte. But God showed me, Willie, listen, I've been preparing you for 25 years to do what you're getting ready to do now. Willie, you want to go out with a bang? Yes, sir. Here it is. So, man, I'm looking for that big bang. I'm not, no, I'm not looking to get shot. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't take me wrong. <laughs> My wife thought we were going to get shot there in Charlotte when we moved into our little rental place and we saw these holes in the wall. And she said, Willie, what are those holes? You think those are bullet holes? I go, no, honey, they're not bullet holes. Then we called the contractor to come in to fix a leak in the roof. He went up there and he came down with a big smile on his face. He said, we find out where the leak has been coming in. I said, where? He said, you know, you got bullet holes up there. I'm like, man, come on. And my wife looks at me, we're going to die in Charlotte. <laughs> we're going to get shot. No, I think we're going to finish. A, I want to finish with a big bang and, and serving the Lord. But let's go back to our text. I want to talk about real quickly um, two things when it comes to the will of God. We have the will of God declared in his word. We have the will of God decided by God himself. For instance, God, God decided which family you were going to be born in. That was God's decision. God decided what color you're going to be. That was God's choice. You can pray about it all you want to. That's our God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Thank God for that. So I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Can you say that this morning? All right, let's say that this morning. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. All right. That's Psalm 139, verse 14, I believe it is. At any rate, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. So that was God's choice. God was the one that chose which time you were born. You weren't born back in the medieval times. Thank God I wasn't. I like this. I like the age in which I was born. I, man, I'm spoiled rotten, man. I got all of these nicest things, man, a refrigerator. Uh, remember growing up with an ice box? We had an ice box. Now we got a refrigerator. Man, I grew up with running water. And I was the one running with the water. <laughs> now we got running water. My joke's a little bit better than yours, brother. I don't know. What does God want? What does God want for you if you're lost? Well, first of all, let me say, if you are lost this morning, God does not want you to go to hell. If you're playing games with your soul and you think you're getting at God and saying, God, I'm going to go to hell. God's like, well, that's your choice. If you want to go to hell, then I'm going to let you go to hell. God don't want you to go to hell. Is there a slide up there? Can we do that slide up there? Let me, you know, let me, let me tell you what God, you know, we talk about what God wants, what he likes, and what he, he doesn't like. Well, God doesn't like for anybody to go to hell. You know, what does he say? God's will for lost people he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way. God wants lost people saved, and that's where you and I come in. The Bible says, how should they call on him and who they not believe? And how should they believe in him who they not heard? And how should they hear, hear without a preacher? So we who are saved can testify to other folks about the grace of God and how they can be saved. And those lost people need us. They need to hear from us the gospel of the grace of God to bring us salvation. God does not want one person here to go to hell. He don't want anybody to go to hell, but he will let you go. If you insist on going to hell, God will let you go. I remember talking to a person that they claimed to be an atheist. It's when I first came back from Germany. I was so glad to be back in the States, man. And I was out there witnessing, was going out door knocking and stuff like that. And I remember talking to a young teenage guy. He says, we are atheists here in this home. I said, I don't want to talk to you. Let me talk to your parents. 
parents came to the door. They were so proud of their son being an atheist. And this guy was proud that he was on his way to hell. I said, man, listen, you don't have to go to hell. Your child is going to go to hell. He says, well, it's a free country. I said, you're absolutely correct. God's given you a freedom of choice. But God don't want anybody to go to hell. He says, listen, I don't want you to go to hell. I, and so if you're on your way to hell this morning, don't go to hell. Please don't go to hell. And I'm so thankful I'm not going there. God does not want you to go to hell. But now for saved people, what does God want for saved people? Let's, let's look at five things that God wants for us as being saved people. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter number five. Ephesians chapter number five. When we know the will of God, so important, five things happen when we know what God's will is. Ephesians chapter five. Five benefits of knowing and doing the will of God. Ephesians chapter 5, let's start at verse 6, and we go to verse 16, and we'll look at five things real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says this. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not uh, ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all uh, goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are uh, reproved are, uh, are man made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, you see what the wherefore is therefore, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I want to say to you that, number one, when we know what God's will is for our life, we will quit wasting time. We would do something known as redeeming the time because the days are evil. Time is something that you can't save up. Time is something that you can't get back once it's spent. Time is the most precious thing that you have. It's the most precious thing that you have right now is time. You've heard the, the, the cliche or the statement, time is money. Yeah, you spend your time making money. People will pay you for your time. At least some folks will. At any rate, Time is the most precious commodity that you have. Time is the beginning of your life, and you have that space in between called your time, and then the end of life. It's precious to you. It's the most precious thing that you have. And when you don't know what God's will is, you'll just be going through the motions of life, getting up, eating, sleeping, drinking, enjoying things, going to sleep, waking up, eating, enjoying things, having a bad day, having a bad week. Going to sleep, getting up again, eating, drinking. To what end is all of this? You have a life without purpose. And when it's all said and done, you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to say to you, he's going to say to me, I want you to give an account of your life. What did you do with the life that I gave you? What did you do with it? Well, Lord, I just enjoyed it. Well, what do you mean you enjoyed it? I ate. And I, I slept, and I rested, and I played, and I had fun, and I got up, and I did it all over again, repeat. You know, God said, well, what did you do for my glory? When you know what God's will is, in verse 16, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I don't know about you, but I see time winding down. I see the horizon of the end times coming. I don't believe that we will face any time of the tribulation as saved people. I believe prior to the, 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 the tribulation starting, I don't believe the tribulation can start until we as a body of people are raptured out of here. But that's not to say that we won't see a lot of groundwork laid. I never thought I would hear in my time of living where they would want to outlaw the Bible. 
in California, they wanted to ban the Bible. Did you get that? Why do they want to ban the Bible? Because they don't want God. I never thought I, you know, I'm, hey, if, if, maybe, maybe you're asleep while men slept. There's legislature people. We, we Christians are in for a rough ride. Get ready for it. We're in for a rough ride. The people that want to run for office now, they, they got an agenda against Christianity. And we're going to be dealing with it. We're going to see a lot of groundwork laid uh, before the tribulation hits. And I think very, it, I think, <laughs> I really think before I check out of here, I'm going to wind up going to jail for just preaching the Bible. They're saying that you can't speak out against certain things that's happening in our nation. And they call it a hate speech. And I'm saying I'm going to lift up my voice like a trumpet. And I'm going to preach out against all of this gender foolishness. Amen. They can take away the 5013C. Take it. They can put me in jail and I'll start a jail ministry. Amen. Amen. You better not say that. I'm going to put you in jail. Well, I'm going to say it when I get in jail. I believe very seriously, Pastor, you and I could go to, if we just preach the book. I'm talking about this perversion that we're seeing on television and commercials and all that sort of stuff. They're ramming this stuff down our throats and say, don't you say nothing against it. I said, I'm going to say, I'm going to preach out against it just like I preach out against stealing. Amen. Amen. Just like I preach out against murder. But we redeem the time. Verse 15, the Bible says, when we know what God's will is, we learn to walk circumspectly. Look here in verse 15. The Bible says, see then, that is you, you make it your business. You make it your business that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. A fool has said in his heart that there's no God. A fool is the one who goes off and just violates the laws of God and don't think that God can do anything about it. They don't even think that God is and God is. We're not to walk like there's no God. We're not to, hey, Christian, we're not to be dibba-dabbing in all this sort of filthiness and wickedness and think that there's no God that can see us, no God can hear us. I mean, no God can look through us. Listen, we're to walk circumspectly. We want, we're supposed to be walking around like, hey, you know, God, God's watching me. Amen. When I was coming up, I never, I never ever got in one bit of trouble when my daddy was around. I only waited for my daddy to go to work to start some foolishness. Because Mr. W.J., he'll put something on you. My dad told me one time, he said, boy, I'm going to beat the black off of you. <laughs> boy, that's a lot of beating, man. <laughs> I remember getting whipped for 10 blocks, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, broad daylight, man. My dad found me at the bus station 10 blocks away. I'm down there playing the pinball machine, supposed to have been home, been gone all day long. He got off work early that day. Man, I, I couldn't beat him, beat him back in. I almost, but I didn't, man. I turned that corner on LaRue Street, and I looked down and saw those, those cement stain, cement, uh, cement stained shoes, and I looked up, okay, that looks like my daddy's shoes. Came on up the legs. That's looking more and more like daddy. Went on up. Looked into those red eyes. Oh, he was mad. He was hot. Boy, where you been? Down at the bus station. All right, let's go back. Well, why are we going back there, dad? We get to Palafox Street and he says, all right, well, I don't want you to get killed. A lot of traffic going across there. He says, well, I guess we'll start here. Okay, we're going to start here for what, dad? He said, well, boy, listen, I'm going to whip you all the way home. And if you run, we're going to start all over. All right. <laughs> man, he whipped me all the way home, man. I tell you what, I didn't get in no trouble when Mr. W.J. was around. We have somebody greater than my dad. We have our Heavenly Father. And there are things that Christians are being involved in, have no business being involved in it. It's all because... They don't have in the back of their mind, daddy is watching. 
God says, when we know his will, we redeem the time and we learn to walk circumspectly. Number three, look at verse 10. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10. The Bible says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You know, it's one thing to say something and it's another thing to prove it. God not not only wants us to say that we love him, but he wants us to prove the sincerity of our love. God wants us to prove some things. Don't you know Paul says, prove your own selves? He says, you know something? Examine your own selves. He says, prove your own selves. Hey, do you have enough Christianity about you to get, get convicted about being a Christian? You know, all these people coming out of the closet. I think these Christians ought to come out of the closet. Amen? Amen. Yeah, people ought to know that you're a Christian. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't take long for them to be around you to know that you are a Christian. When you're in the will of God, you prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. And then look at verse 6. When you know what God's will is, you're less likely to be deceived. Look at verse 6, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. The Bible says, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. There's a movement in our society that's going away from God. Things are winding down in holiness and and, uh, they're winding up in wickedness. And not only are they winding up in wickedness, the wrath of God. Listen, we not don't forget this. The wrath of God has been heaped up, man. It's been heaped up. God is watching this foolishness go on. And, you know, he's watching. He's been patient. He's watching. He's been patient. But there's going to come a time when God says, I have had enough. I have had enough. And I'm going to demonstrate it. You don't think I can, I can do something? Let me show you. And the Bible talked about, listen, oh, the wrath of God is going to be poured out. In seven-year time frame, over four billion people are going to be destroyed in seven years. In seven years, at least four billion people are going to be destroyed. And it's going to be a horrendous time. You know, God's going to, he's going to remove the fear of man from the animal kingdom. Right now, you know why you can go to a big old cow and go, woo, woo, and the cow, cow kind of scamper off because God put the fear of man. You know, hey, you know, it's time it's fishing season, right? Is it fishing time? Right, yeah. You go catch some, man. I, if I was up here, I'd be trying to catch some too. Don't you know if it wasn't for the grace of God and the power of God that God gave to man to have dominion over the animals and over the fish of the sea, you know what would be happening? You'd be walking along the bank, and all of a sudden you'll see something come flying out of the, out of the water. And you'll go over there and look at it. And you say, oh, that's a $20 bill. There'd be a shark up there rolling you in. God gave us dominion over the fish of the sea. He's the one that gave us uh, power over all of that. But there's going to come a time when God's going to remove the fear of man from the animal kingdom. Then that friendly cat that you have ain't going to be so friendly. That little rabbit, a squirrel. You ever had a squirrel run up you? Don't try it. A squirrel will run up on you, man. You'll be trying your best to pull him off you. <laughs> man, when God unleashed the animal kingdom upon mankind, the Bible says that by this was a third part of man destroyed by the beast of the field. Time is winding down, but there's a movement that says, no, things are going, getting better. Things are getting better. Look at this technology. We can do nanotechnology. We can do all of this. Things are getting better. Man is, man is reaching his pinnacle. He's just moving in a good direction. God says, no, he's moving towards destruction. And sad to say, many of God's people are buying in on that. There's some things I would tell you that some Baptist churches are doing, but because of children being here, I won't say it. But it's abomination what they're doing now. Baptist churches. Used to be a time Baptists would hang on to the truths. But now Baptists are caving in. All sorts of foolishness. When you know what God's will is, you'll be less likely to, uh, to be deceived. And then fifthly and lastly, 
when we know what God's will is, we abstain from being partakers with them. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You know, there has to come a time when God's people come out from among them. Amen. There's a time when God's people have messed up, but then they start getting right. I want to be the type of person, the type of Christian. Yes, I messed up. The Bible says, and while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And God knew all there was to know about Willie Bird when he entered into this contract with Willie Bird. And I messed up in my life. But God is my witness. There's times I said, Lord God, I don't want to mess up anymore. God help me. And God said, well, I'm glad you recognize that. Since you judge it, I won't have to judge it. Now, come on, son. Get up and let's start doing right. You come out from among them. Come out from among them and don't be partakers with them. I'm reminded of Lot. The Bible says Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. And the Bible tells, tells me that Lot, he vexed his righteous soul from day to day in seeing and hearing the filthy communication of the wicked. And I'm here to tell you on television, on your tablets and all that sort of stuff, on your smartphones, there's a whole bunch. There's more garbage on it than good stuff. And God's people are exposing themselves to it and exposing themselves to it and getting entrenched in that stuff. And, you know, the church is becoming more worldly and the world is becoming more churchy. You can't hardly tell the difference nowadays. But, you know, some days are people of God that can come out from among them. And be separate, saith the Lord. When you know God's will, you know, I have nothing to do with that. I'm, I'm backing off from it. And God snatched me away from it, uh, from that Sodom and Gomorrah. Snatched me away from all of this wickedness. And that's what we want to do when you know God's will. I don't know if I'm making any sense to you. It just got so much in my heart as I see what's going on in, my, in, in churches and in society. It's so sad and it's sickening. And to see God's people on the wrong path. Listen, come out from among them. When you know God's will, and the only way you can know it is start reading that book. I share this testimony and I quit. Brother McGovern, I've been reading through the Bible more than once a year now. In August 2010, my dad, who I thought was my best friend, died and he left everything that he had to a stranger that threw my whole family for a loop I couldn't I still can't wrap my mind around it dad what what happened to you and I told him on his deathbed I said dad it's never been about the money the only thing we as your children wanted from you is just for you to love us that's all we wanted it wasn't about no money. He died. I had to buy new clothes for him to bury him in. He didn't want any of his children nor his wife to get one red cent from him. My dad had to be hurting. I didn't know nothing about it. That threw me for a loop. Then seven months later, the woman that brought me into this world, that God used to bring me into this world, the one who taught me about love, the one who I said, if anybody loved me, it was her. That was my mama. She died. And for two years, Brother McGovern, I think I was fighting depression, didn't know what it was. But I told my church then, back there at Berean, I said, I said listen, I'm not whole right now. I said, I'm going through the fire. And I remember in December of 2011, I'm walking up on the 16th green. Brother Everett, you don't know what the 16th green is. About 6.30 in the morning, nobody out there. And I break down and cry like a baby. I said, God, what's wrong with me? I said, God, I can't keep on going this way. I said, God, what's wrong with me? And the Lord spoke to my heart. He says, Willie, your faith is being tested like it never has been. You're going through the fire. I said, okay, God. 
So what's wrong with me? He said, well, you're believing the Bible, but you're not believing it like you should. I said, Lord, what's the cure? I'm having a conversation. Now, he's not talking back, but in my mind, I'm hearing these thoughts. He says, Romans 10, 17. So then faith coming by him, and him by the word of God. So I said, okay. Lord, that's what's wrong with me. I'm beginning to doubt you. And to increase my faith in you, I need to read more of your word. So that was December. Just finished reading through the Bible. Guess what I did in January? I read through the Bible in 28 days. And guess what I did in February? I read through the Bible again. Guess what I did in March? I read through the Bible again. You said, you can't do that. How would you know? Have you tried it? God showed me, Willie, you've never been here before. And you need me. So I started reading through the Bible. Now, I don't make it through it every month now, but I started. I try to read through the New Testament every month. Amen. As a result of all of that, God's been changing me. And God's been showing me, Willie, you thought you knew me. You're just now getting to know me. And God's opened up a total different understanding about him. And it's hard to explain. You, you, if you experience it, then you know what I'm talking about. It's just like eating a pineapple. How does a pineapple taste? You can explain it all you want to. It's not until you cut a slice off and give it to the person. Then, as the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God's working in my life. He's working in my life right now. I don't know if I'm making sense to you, but I know one thing. I'm seeing what he sees. My eyes are open. And I want to do his will, and I want you to do his will as well. <laughs> Let's come to that place today. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Let's bow our heads together. Every head bow, never eye close. I want to thank you for being patient. Thank you for putting up with me.